So the next item we have on our agenda this evening is an informational update, ID 0956. It is the 2021 PFAS update. And I'd like to invite Public Works Director Bob York and Eric Buer, Principal Hydrologist with Fairline Consulting to make the presentation. Welcome, Bob. Welcome, Eric. No, thank you, Mayor Pauly. Good evening, council members. And tonight we're providing what's now become an annual update, annual presentation on the uh, PFAS issue we've been dealing with. Uh, PFAS stands for her, her and polyfluoral alcohol substances. So from here on out in, in the presentation, Eric and I will be referring to the issue as PFAS. So I'm glad to have Eric uh, on board tonight to be part of this presentation. Eric's been working on the uh, on the groundwater investigation characterization phase of this for a number of years now, as we'll discuss in a minute. And uh, so welcome, Eric. Um, and next slide, please, Tisha. By way of quick overview of our presentation, brief background on how this PFAS issue um, uh, manifests itself with the city and followed by Eric's presentation on what our partnership's been doing with Eastside Fire and Rescue and Ecology in the city on <clears throat> an update on now emerging into phase three of that work. Uh, I'll give you a quick update on the city of Issaquah Water Utility progress and our efforts to address the presence of PFAS that finds itself into our water supply. Um, and we'll briefly talk about up, up, upcoming development, developments and drivers, followed by a quick summary and the opportunity for questions and answers. Next slide, please, Tisha. Um, <clears throat> as most of you might recall, we discovered the presence of PFAS in our water, water supply back in 2015, due to the requirement EPA presented to us on <clears throat> taking samples of unregulated contaminants. And all of a sudden we learned what PFOS meant as a result of that uh, uh, discovery. Uh, immediately the council acted and in by mid 2016, we were treating the uh, primary source of the uh, problem, which was well four. That's been over the years, looking back and reflecting, that's been a, a very successful project, albeit one we would rather not have to put in in the first place. But we continue to achieve non-detect levels, even with the lowest possible state-of-the-art detection limits in the uh, water that's produced as a result of our treatment of uh, well for using granular activated carbon. Then over time, because the PFAS in our, in our groundwater was <clears throat> due to the presence of, or the activity related to firefighting foams. We uh, um, developed a partnership with Eastside Fire and Rescue. And because we were one of the first, if not the first in the state to all of a sudden uncover a PFAS issue, Department of Ecology took interest in, in the city's situation and has been a partner ever since 2018. Um, so, the type of work that we're doing, which Eric will quickly summarize, will uh, <clears throat> uh, started back in 2018 and continues on to this day. Then, in, as you may recall, in mid-2021, uh, we looked at different options to deal with the PFAS present in our water supply, and uh, we came up with an option, which I'll discuss more in detail in, the, in a moment. We are implementing the water utility game plan uh, actually with expedited activities that are within our budget to meet the uh, emerging soon to be final Washington State Department of Health uh, regulations. So with that, next slide, please. I'll turn it over to, I think, Eric uh, Bjor. Um, by the way, Eric works for an Issaquah based company that has over 100 employees right near downtown Issaquah. So go ahead, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to the City Council for being here and taking the time. Um, yeah, so my name is Eric Buer. I'm a principal hydrogeologist at Fairlawn Consulting. Our flagship office is on 5th 
uh, Street, I believe. Just uh, it's actually on the maps that I'll show you. And um, I've been with the company now for uh, just over six years, and uh, it's all going very well. So Bob gave a great introduction here. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through the high level uh, where we've come from and what we've done and then where we're going on the investigation. Um, <clears throat> what has occurred, I guess, starting with uh, the, investigate the, the first year. So the initial investigation that followed the discovery of PFAS um, focused on sort of a linear um, profile down the set the axis of the valley. Uh, the suspected cause was AFFF, which is aqueous film forming foam. It's a firefighting agent. Um, it's a somewhat tricky substance to handle. And so it's frequently trained with, um, there have been sort of a number of generations of detergents over the years. Uh, I'm not gonna go sorry, into the details of that, but suffice to say that um, new detergents required new equipment and um, training events were done outside. And so, you know, Bob's at one end of the pipe. He's basically, once the water comes out of the ground, my job is everything that happens before it hits that pipe. Um, what we've done since then um, as a partnership between Eastside Fire and Rescue, the City of Issaquah, and the Department of Ecology is uh, begin the process and then actually work through a substantial amount of it of characterizing the nature and extent of PFAS, both in soil and groundwater, in the lower Issaquah Valley. And so what started out sort of, I think, is a relatively simple conceptual site model, single release migrating linearly, um, sort of due north has um, actually added a lot of additional detail since we started that process. Um, we've identified five areas of interest. Those are all locations that had historical AFFF training. Um, we performed soil sampling in all of those locations, starting with what's called multi-incremental sampling. Um, it's essentially a way to composite a big area of soil to get a, a very robust characterization of that soil. And then we've installed 53 new monitoring wells. Those are both shallow and um, what we call intermediate, but um, essentially deeper, 60 to 120 feet deep to uh, evaluate all of these locations uh, to sort of begin to understand with greater detail what's happened, what the site looks like effectively from the surface down, and then how that ultimately affects the, uh, the city's water supply. Uh, if I could get the next slide, please. So uh, this is just looking a little bit of sort of, you know, progress. We can see where we're at. Um, we've been very fortunate, uh, both the city and EFNR have worked really well together to uh, secure funds for a lot of this. Because of the nature of PFAS, they're considered toxic at very low concentrations. Um, the work is fairly expensive. The analytical methods are, um, you know, costly per sample. And, um, you know, when you're drilling 60 to 100, 120 feet down, um, I mean, the wells and everything else, it's all just the, you know, the direct costs that add up pretty quickly. So um, this initially started with Department of Commerce grants, and then uh, the most recent round of work, which is uh, reported as of March 2021, was secured through uh, appropriation funding that was lobbied um, by the city and EFR and our jointly. Um, it was a very successful project. What I want you to just take away from this slide, and I wish I had a little bit better color popping on the wells on the, in the center and on the, uh, what's my right, it should be everyone else's right too, is simply that you can see there was an initial characterization done immediately after the UCMR, that's the Unmonitored Contaminant Rule sampling at COI4. Um, so there's an initial sort of uh, plume that was developed there. There's a lot of question marks. There's relatively little density in terms of where the wells are placed. Um, the work that we've done since then is essentially filled that map in. So that is both in the plan view, looking at the density of wells across all the areas that we think were affected, and then also in the profile view. So working from the ground surface downward. And um, what we have now are pretty well-defined areas that we think are affected both in shallow groundwater and in intermediate deeper groundwater, which is the uh, water that uh, moves directly into uh, well four. Next slide, please. So where we are now in that process, um, we've done data collection in all five, ar five areas of interest. Uh, it looks based on the preliminary data that we have that um, there was a, you know, a event on the east side of the valley that affected shallow groundwater. We don't see data that suggests that that's moved into intermediate groundwater. On the uh, west side of the valley, we identified locations at the former or at the existing elementary school and Dodd Fields, and then also at the Eastside Fire headquarters facility that have both shallow and intermediate impacts. 
Um, within those areas of interest that we had, we had impacts. Eastside Fire has the longest AFFF uh, training history, and it also had the highest concentrations in soil. So the next stage um, in the investigation, and this is what we're, we're currently working through, is to actually begin designing um, an, a remedial approach here. So PFAS are not currently regulated by the state. They are um, likely to be regulated soon. Like I mentioned earlier, they're considered toxic at very low concentrations, which makes the remediation sort of difficult. Um, I, the best way I can kind of describe that is that the problem you're facing is you're treating mostly clean media all the time. <clears throat> you can imagine if you were, uh, I don't know, trying to vacuum dirt out of your carpet and your carpet is already 99.999% clean and you're charged with getting that last, you know, one, uh, 0. 0.0001 percent of the dirt out, um, how long you'd have to spend cleaning it. It's very energetically intensive. So um, the question is, how do we do that in a way that's cost effective and that ultimately is going to restore the aquifer to its highest beneficial use? Um, so what we have developed at this initial stage is what's called a pilot test, which is a simple, uh, you know, simply saying that we're going to see whether or not we get the desired results um, with the approach that we think is most likely to succeed. And then if that works, then um, it would be scaled up to a full-scale remediation approach. And so what you're looking at here is the west side of um, the headquarters facility. Um, there's an injection field, which is shown uh, with sort of the overlapping uh, yellow circles there. Those would be direct injection points. And then we'll monitor groundwater uh, once the treatment reagent goes in. And we should see a, a decrease in um, reported concentrations of PFAS in groundwater. It's been an unusually dry spring, so the water, the groundwater there is actually the lowest we've ever seen it, um, which is a little bit challenging for us, but it doesn't uh, ultimately change the overall design, uh, it just might have changed the, uh, the installation approach. If I could get the next slide, please. So I have, uh, this is one more, so I promise I'll be done soon. Uh, this is that same uh, view that you're just looking at with essentially a slice through the ground um, heading from the southwest to the northeast. Uh, this shows, again, if you look at the, uh, the yellow dots on the previous slide, the sort of pink box that's uh, left of center would be the injection area. Um, the treatment reagent is essentially what's called colloidal activated carbon. It's just very, very finely ground charcoal um, with some proprietary agents that makes it sticky. Um, and the idea here is that it retains the PFAS in the subsurface so that it no longer can leach into the aquifer and migrate off-site. Um, if that is successful, you know, we would hopefully see that as, a, as an approach that can be scaled up to both uh, do full-scale remediation at this location and then also at the other locations we've identified um, that are impacting the aquifer. And uh, then there are other sort of, uh, you know, steps that we can take, both uh, removal of unsaturated media or capping the surface um, to prevent infiltration to essentially cut off all the available migration pathways so that um, we don't have anything else that's, that's making its way into groundwater. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot of text here. Um, it's just a, a, a brief wrap up and Bob did earlier today send out, um, there, there was some uh, free information prior to the meeting. Um, all of this is in reports that are in the public domain. So we'll make sure you have that link if you do wanna look through uh, the details. Uh, there's a lot more figures, there's a ton of data. But in essence, um, you know, like I said, the area that we're evaluating here is quite large and we have several historical training locations. So we've made a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, there are still a limited number of data gaps that we think will be necessary to do sort of, I guess, the total remediation of the site. Um, however, Sorry, tap my space bar. Um, at this stage, you know, we're focusing on uh, the location that has the longest history of use and the highest concentrations, um, both because that's the best one to measure when you're testing technology, uh, and also it has really the greatest benefit uh, in terms of return for being restored first. And with that, I am done. Okay, thank, thanks, Eric. Uh, that's a great summary, very technical. And Eric did a good job trying to provide the key key points of that ongoing investigation. So the goal here for what Eric's doing is, and what we're doing as a partnership is stop the source from continuing to migrate into the uh, groundwater and therefore impact our, our, our wells. Um, <clears throat> on the other side of the fence is taking care of the problem when it reaches our wells and uh, and that's what we are doing right now with this 
um, game plan that the, the council approved uh, uh, over the course of the middle of last year. Uh, and we are on, on target to meet that game plan, which includes uh, <clears throat> uh, deferring any major capital expenditure uh, significant in nature to, uh, to way into the future, um, probably 10 or, or more, probably even more time frame than that. And as you can imagine with the supply chain issues, et cetera, we, we'd be hard pressed to, to, uh, to um, get anything going uh, uh, as other, uh, as we've seen with recent capital project bids. Um, so deferring that was, a, I think in hindsight, a, a wise maneuver. And we took it, we are installing measures to allow the blending of the purchase water from Cascade Water Alliance at a discount and groundwater. Uh, you'll hear more about that in a second. Um, our main source of ongoing problems is the well five in terms of PFAS and, and actually a few other parameters. So we're taking advantage of the opportunity that Cascade offered us to, if we shut down one of our independent supplies, in this case, well five, they will provide us heavily discounted water to make up that shortfall because they have uh, more water than they that they've contracted for that they can possibly sell. So uh, uh, that's our game plan that is now imminently subject to council approval, ready to implement. And we will monitor the need for increased water supply over time. Uh, but so far, even with this hot summer, um, we haven't seen the peak daily demands um, seem to trend upward uh, in <clears throat> so we uh, we still have a long runway ahead of us in terms of when we would actually need to worry about the more expensive plan B. So next slide, please. Um, by very quick background, here's the um, the interim game plan that we're uh, we're implementing. Uh, briefly, Bellevue sort of provides Cascade water to Cougar Mountain and South Cove. Uh, Cascade Water Alliance supplies it for the Highlands. Our game plan is to uh, uh, upgrade an inner tie near SR 900 to uh, allow the more constant use of Cascade Water in the Valley Zone. Um, we will uh, upgrade with minor improvements the um, Gilman Well Four. In that case, to add fluoride, so we have a consistent fluoride dose throughout the city of the optimal dose being around 0.7 milligrams per liter. The Risden wells will also get fluoride. Um, and also we will raise the pH of the Risden wells, which we're ready to do uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, to make sure that we comply with the lead and copper rules. And the reason for that is when the Gilman well five, which supplies the higher pH shuts down, the Risden wells are in a somewhat lower pH, um, the lower pH water than is optimal for lead and copper roll compliance. So <laughs> we are ready even as we speak to uh, to uh, take care of that by adding a, um, a, a, a FDA approved agent to uh, raise the pH slightly of the, the two Risden wells. The Risden wells, by the way, have never <clears throat> shown any concentration measurable of uh, PFAS in those two wells. So we're fortunate to have two high capacity production wells that are continuing to stay PFAS free. Next slide, please, uh, Tisha. Um, <clears throat> we are implementing the game plan that's an interim, but that interim solution requires a building. The building requires permitting. And so our our <clears throat> plan improvements wouldn't be ready till mid-2022. However, knowing that there's some emerging uh, uh, Department of Health uh, regulations that will soon be final as early as <clears throat> the fourth quarter of 2021, we've, within the budget that we had authorized, done a, a little temporary system uh, to, um, which I'll talk about in a second, to uh, to make the Risden wells 
raise the pH of those wells and, and therefore, especially given this time of year when uh, most of our irrigation requirements are now diminishing, our three um, supply wells can serve <clears throat> uh, with enough capacity to deal with the, uh, <clears throat> um, the winter season, which is emerging right now, essentially, the, uh, the, uh, the more wet weather season. One thing that's happened that actually is reverse trend in the last sample results is that all five PFAS levels have increased slightly over time. They do have PFAS in them in that lower aquifer, as Eric mentioned. Um, the PFAS was in the mid 30s, it went to 50. That created a concern about how high the PFAS was in our drinking water. The PFAS has never exceeded the EPA health advisories or any other regulatory requirement so uh, but we nonetheless made revisions to how how much well water came out of well five to uh, to blend a little more treated water from well four into well five and <clears throat> keep the PFAS levels um, below the uh, the uh, 40 part per trillion detection limit that's uh, part of an EPA approved uh, method that's used for uh, potable water uh, now the numbers have gone from uh, 50 to 40. I don't know if that's a trend that will continue, uh, but they're still higher than what we need to have in or order to meet the what's called the um, SALs or state action levels that will be final again as early as December of this year. Those action levels that are implemented by the Department of Health will soon become the uh, action levels that ecology Department of Ecology will use for cleanup levels, as Eric mentioned. So. Um, next slide, please, Tisha. So we're on track to put this temporary strategy into place. Um, the uh, temporary systems installed at the Risden wells, it's been uh, tested. Um, the chemical that we need to raise the pH has actually been delivered and is in our storage facility. Um, we're essentially ready to go. Um, and um, so that's part of the great news uh, that's emerging in terms of where we are we're shifting we're ready to shift our uh, talus to um, our talus neighborhood to cwa cascade water uh, on october 1st um, and that would be the same time we shut down well five so the approximately the lost well five production is equal to the talus demand so Again, another uh, fortuitous uh, piece of information. To shut down well five, we would uh, uh, be super cautious and recommend that the council uh, uh, authorize putting the water right that we have for well five into trust. That's fully reversible at any time. Uh, that's on your calendar as AB 8214 tonight. We, again, we're ready to purchase CWA water at that discount, uh, that's in our adopted rate study, it's on our budget. And um, as part of that negotiation, we will adopt, uh, subject to council approval on the AB 8238, we will add a RCFC, Regional Capital Facility sur Charge Surcharge to our new customers that hook up effective uh, October 1st. All this has been vetted with Cascades officials and they're ready to implement the game plan if the council so desires. Okay. Next slide, Tisha. So in summary, as Eric indicated in his part of the presentation, we're uh, continuing our partnership and making progress on our aquifer investigations to the point where now we're trying fairly innovative for PFAS at least, uh, remedial technologies. And uh, the Issaquah water system is on track, schedule and budget to meet the state action levels in advance of the deadline, which essentially means less than 15 parts per trillion. But really, if I, based on all the results to date, we expect non-detect PFAS and all our supply sources at the lowest um, state-of-the-art EPA approved detection limits as soon as we shut well five off and shift the cascade water. 
Next final slide, Tisha. So, uh, Merrick and I stand ready to answer any questions the council might have. Thank you. Bob, Eric, thank you for the presentation on both of those water topics, not just the issue that we're working on with Department of Ecology, but also our own supply side as well. You do have a couple of questions. We'll start first with Council Member Hall, followed by Council Member Mark. Uh, thank you. This is Council Member Hall and Director York. Eric, thank you very much for the thorough update. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. I actually don't have any questions about PFOS or the PFOS partnership. The temporary strategy certainly seems to be in line with uh, our discussion from last year and also with emerging information from the PFOS partnership. So that looks good to me. Um, from slide 10, which kind of had the map of the water supply uh, routes into our different neighborhoods. I just had a question out of curiosity for Director York when um, the SPAR booster pump station is complete and we have the um, uh, redundancy created into the Isqua Highlands water system. I'm just curious where that line would be drawn um, so that we would have, you know, cascade water supplying the Isqua Highlands, but then also a line from another well, I would assume. So I'm just curious where that would fit. Thank you. Are me, uh, then let me take a stab at the uh, short-term answer. When SPAR gets done and we have redundant feed, our immediate plan is to keep on feeding the Isqua Highlands with Cascade water. However, we do have the option of doing both. So uh, the booster pump station will can take fluoridated um, groundwater or a combination thereof, and we have complete um, uh, ability to feed with a groundwater, a blend, or cascade water. So, but our game, immediate game plan, as I uh, 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 envision it, is to for now to keep the cascade water going to uh, uh, the highlands for number for one reason that pressure of the cascade water is already substantially higher than our groundwater or valley water. So I save on pumping costs or we save on pumping costs by doing that. But there's complete flexibility at that point, uh, Council Member Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Director York. It looks like Council Member Hall got his question answered. Let's go to Council Member Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is Council Member Martz. So, uh, so I understand our efforts to change our water supplies, um, but the Farallon stuff today uh, seems new to me. And so um, I have a question about um, that looks like I see things about permeable reactive barriers and three dimensional models of water flow. And that all looks expensive. And so my question is, what's the relationship between the Farallon mitigations that you presented today and any um, expenses associated with that kind of stuff uh, going forward when you talk about our strategies. I was, I was well aware of us buying water and shutting down pump five and all that kind of good stuff, but the, the big science project kind of caught me by surprise. Well, um, I could take that or Eric can, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, much of the work that's been done so far, or almost all of it, essentially everything that Farallon has done has been, um, uh, paid for by external sources, first the Department of Commerce, and now even on an ongoing basis, the Department of Ecology. Uh, so uh, it sounds expensive, it, it, but so far it's been paid for by largely external funds. Now, Is the there an expectation that a part of our water policies going forward will involve uh, expenses for mitigations other than where we get our water. These, this thing looks very interesting, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <it's expensive. laughs> yeah. Do you want, um, I'll answer that. I'll try to, and Mayor Pauly and others can chime in, but, uh, yeah, it could get expensive. That's why we're doing all this in preparation, this investigative work early to try to see what remediation, remediation technologies make sense. Um, um, but we have to weigh that against the cost of continuing to treat the PFAS in the water. So there's a lot of upcoming um, revelations occurring uh, that will occur about our strategy that um, involve looking at different options. But at some point, I think ecology will want the uh, uh, 
issue of our groundwater dealt with uh, over time. Eric, you want to add anything or Mayor Paul? Well, actually, yeah, thank you, Director York. That was great. Um, Councilmember Martz, we're in a really unique position in that we're not under any order to manage, you know, the contamination. And so far, uh, we have had very willing partners in order to make sure that we are participating in a study that will provide information to the benefit of EPA and DOE. So um, it's a liability for us, um, but we don't have a good answer on what lies ahead. It is such a big question mark across the country as to what will be required of all uh, fire district, military bases, airports, anyone who use this product and whether or not the liability lies under CERCLA with cradle to grave, where this is a contaminant that the manufacturers may have to pay for a significant amount. So we're very, very early days. I think one thing we can do is make sure that during the budget conversations that are coming up over the next few weeks that we highlight what our expenditures may be. It, it, it is, while it is an issue affecting our groundwater and falls under public works, this is really under the environmental umbrella of the work that Bob does. All right. Thank you. I am not seeing any other questions at this point in time. Uh, Director York and Eric, thank you so much for coming tonight. And I just really want to express my gratitude as well for participating in this extremely unique one of a kind pilot project. Um, I'm used to in my previous life sitting at tables with three consultants, three lawyers and three property owners trying to point fingers at each other and figure it out. And Somehow this team got all the lawyers away from the table and got a great consultant and we're all working together. And that is something we should be very, very proud of. So thank you very much for all of your work on this. I'm going to Thank you. Pleasure thank to do you, it. Eric. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see you, Eric. Nice to see you too. So there is no action requested on this informational informational item. But as Director York mentioned, council action is being sought on two related items under the consent calendar today. And that is where we're moving next. The consent calendar was distributed to council in advance. And if authorized, the items on the consent calendar will be considered together and approved by one motion. I would like to invite council member D. Michelle to uh, make a statement um, on the payables for influence the choice. Council member D. Michelle. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pauly. Um, I would like to state for the record that I am currently employed with an entity that is included in the city's payables, Influence the Choice. I currently fill the role of temporary executive director of Influence the Choice. The city serves as a fiscal agent for this agency in the disbursement of a federal grant. Grant funds are being dispersed under this month's accounts payable. I have asked for advice from the city attorney as to whether this warrants a conflict of interest and have been informed that I am not legally required to be excused from voting as the city is carrying out a decision that was previously made by the council. However, for the sake of transparency, I would like to declare this employment and have my statement entered in the minutes. Thank you. Thank you, council member D. Michelle. Have the payables and payroll been reviewed? Yes. They have, Mr. Council President. Thank you very much. Does any council member desire to remove any item from the consent calendar and consider it under regular business? And I am keeping my eye on the chat to see if any council member would choose to do that. I am not seeing anything. Can I get, oh, Council President Hunt, a motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Council President Hunt. I move to approve the consent calendar as it appears in this evening's agenda. Thank you, and Deputy Council President Gray. Second. Thank you very much. So I'm going to get the city clerk to do the roll call vote. Starting with Council Member Walsh. Aye. Council Member D. Michelle. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Hall. Aye. Council President Hunt. Aye. Council Member Martz. Aye. Deputy Council President Ray. Aye. At seven ayes, zero nays. Thank you very much, City Clerk. That passes unanimously. The next item of business on our agenda this evening under regular business is AB 8253, 
the proposed 2020 budget and uh, council will be hearing this evening's presentation and received copies of the proposed budget uh, by email today. So community members and dedicated city council, I am pleased to present my 2022 proposed budget for the city of Issaquah. Soon after the pandemic reached King County in 2020, we started to forecast significant dips in our revenues. We needed to reduce our services to match our expected revenue levels, and that meant taking a hard look at the community's priorities and making some very difficult decisions. Now, nearly two years later, as the economy recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing a stronger than expected financial performance when compared to what the city assumed a year ago. With much of this strength coming from one time, or in other words, non-sustainable sources. My proposed budget leverages these one-time funds to not only help Issaquah recover from the pandemic, but also make essential investments in our community's top priorities. Meanwhile, this proposal also includes modest revenue increases and commits a conservative amount of ongoing costs to meet Issaquah's long-term needs. My 2022 proposed budget, which totals $146.6 million, includes $61.4 million for the general fund and $22.7 million in capital investments. I'd like to thank our city council members for a very thoughtful and robust discussion earlier this year that helped identify funding priorities based on our strategic plan, as well as feedback from Issaquah's most recent community survey. As you'll see throughout this proposed budget, the funding priorities for the year include mobility, growth and development, community engagement, public safety and human services, quality of life enhancements, equity, diversity and inclusion, and data-driven decision-making. First and foremost, I'm committed to providing the needed resources to keep Issaquah safe. A key focus of my proposed budget is to restore funding for public safety needs following COVID-19 budget reduction. This added capacity means our police officers can now also help support other cities goals, such as improving mobility moving forward. In addition, I propose adding more non-commissioned public safety positions to the department that will help with reporting, data analysis, and building connections within our community. In total, the proposed new positions include a sergeant, corporal, officer, crime prevention analyst, and behavioral health coordinator. Similar to police agencies throughout our region and nation, Issaquah Police Department is facing recruitment and retention challenges. To support this essential department, we are hiring a limited term position to help the team find and retain quality employees. While the city continues to recover from the pandemic, I am confident that this spending plan for 2022 will meet our community's needs and ensure our financial sustainability moving forward. I look forward to working with our dedicated city council, hardworking staff, and our passionate community members to finalize an adopted budget this fall. We will now put our schedule up on the screen, which, and I will let Tisha, the city clerk, do that before I proceed going through the dates. Can we have that shared on the screen? I show that it's being shared, Mayor. Is it visible? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know what? Thank you, city clerk. My notes were in front of it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All of these remote meetings. So much fun. So the schedule includes an overview on September 28th, a community meeting on September 29th, and public hearings on October 4th and November 15th. Deliberations will take place throughout October and November with an adoption scheduled for November 15th. So thank you for allowing me time to discuss the 2022 proposed budget. The next item of business this evening is AB 8249 the affordable housing revenues allocation. And we are looking for some direction this evening for the administration. This is the first time this item is before council and I'd like to invite Deputy City Administrator, Andrea Snyder to present this item. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, Mayor Polly. This is Andrea Snyder, the Deputy City Administrator and thank you to 
<clears throat> to Tisha who's pulling up the slides. Appreciate that always. Um, as uh, next slide, please, Tisha. Um, the purpose for our discussion tonight is um, that the administration is asking city council to determine the next steps regarding the revenues collected for the purposes of affordable housing. And I'll be referring to those revenues by uh, the state bill that they're often referred to by their, their numbers. So that's the 1406 um, and House Bill 1590, um, which city council adopted those, uh, those revenues um, last year. And the essential question for you this evening to consider is, should the city keep collecting these revenues until more cost information is available for the transit oriented development and opportunity center project that I'll be referring to often as TODOC. Uh, or should the city consider allocating some of those funds now uh, to other efforts and we're going to talk a little bit later about what some of those alternatives and options are should uh, city council want to consider allocating them with this budget cycle. So just a little bit of background and reminder, because we have not talked about the TODOC in a while. Since 2016, the city has been engaged in this public-private partnership to build 165 plus units of affordable housing. Uh, that also includes the supportive services. That's the Opportunity Center part of this project. It is the city's single largest effort regarding affordable housing and trying to increase the supply that we've been directly involved in. And uh, the city has committed in the past to waiving permitting fees as we do for affordable housing projects, and that we would seek certain funds uh, to subsidize the construction of the Opportunity Center. And as I think most of you recall, we've received, um, <clears throat> excuse me, $3 million in state grants towards that effort to subsidize the Opportunity, subsidize the opportunity Center construction. So, um, Thank you. Uh, also, as a bit of an update into where we are with the TOD project right now, we're still in conversations with the property owner to negotiate the purchase and sale agreements. Once we uh, have that purchase and sale agreement signed, which we anticipate to occur this fall, then the city's chosen developer team will be able to finalize design for the project and get updated construction costs for the TODFC project. Uh, as for more background, the revenues that we're talking about this evening, the first revenue is that 1406, and that's the adopted state, shares, um, state shared sales tax, where the state has been collecting the same sales tax that they have for years from the city of Issaquah, but um, have uh, offered a portion of that sales tax back to the city that we can use to fund affordable housing, projects, the acquisition of affordable housing, the operation of affordable housing, and um, as well as tenant rental assistance. Those funds can go towards tenant rental assistance. And the city adopted those uh, back in, in 2020 and has been collecting since. We've collected $179,000 to date. Per state law, we are limited to collecting uh, something to the tune of 100 and uh, $22,000 per year. The other funds that we're talking about this evening, uh, HB, HB 1590, those are the uh, adopted uh, affordable housing sales tax revenues. And uh, those are um, accumulating at a much higher rate. That's $995,000 that we've collected to date since adoption. And we've been holding on to those funds, not allocating them, in wishes to partner with King County on um, how we can ensure some of those benefits come back to Issaquah. And one of the ideas that was discussed at the time of adoption by council was that we would use some of these funds to help uh, fund and subsidize the construction of the Opportunity Center. And so since uh, 2020, we have been uh, collecting these taxes, tax revenues and setting them aside. And um, Again, both sources of these fundings uh, may be able to support affordable housing and also may be able to help pay for uh, some of the waived uh, permitting fees that the city has uh, waived to support the affordable housing. But 
um, we can waive those fees, but we still have to pay a portion of those fees back according to state law. So these revenues can be used for that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the, the proposal before you this evening and is that we could, uh, the city could continue to collect the affordable housing sales tax revenues and return to council once the estimates for the TODOC project have been updated. The last that we heard um, was an old estimate from several years ago, about three years ago, that the construction for the, TO, for the Opportunity Center would be about $5 million. And we know that construction costs have increased since then. Um, and so uh, we would be getting updated construction estimates in uh, the first quarter of next year. That's when we would anticipate that. So the proposal would be that we would hold on to these affordable housing sales tax revenues and return to council once we have a better idea of what those construction costs are. And then uh, come back and discuss with council and consider what options for allocations of the remaining or future funds from these revenues. So that's the proposal the administration has for you this evening. Next slide, please. There are some alternatives for your consideration. So instead of holding on to these funds, continuing to collect them and not allocating them at this time, the alternatives are, of course, that we could use a portion of the 1406 funds to fund tenant assistance programs. We could, uh, City Council could direct us to provide a portion of the 1406 funds and or the 1590 funds to ARCH in exchange for other services or as an additional contribution to the trust funds. Uh, or we could, uh, City Council could prefer that the city keep the revenues collected to date from the 1590 funds, but remand the ability to collect the tax and all future revenues back to King County in support of regional efforts. Those are some alternatives for your consideration this evening. Also, I'd like to point out that these alternatives still exist. Uh, whether you make the decision tonight and provide direction tonight, or whether uh, you would like the administration to come back in the winter, uh, first quarter of next year, to discuss this after we have a better idea of what those cost estimates for construction of the Opportunity Center are. So uh, council may be able to choose multiple choice and choose all of the above if you if you choose um, this this winter. So that's that's really the um, the question tonight is we're asking council to direct us if you would like uh, the if you would like to consider allocating some of these funds at this time and that's something that we would need to come back to you with more information during the budget process that we're just kicking off this evening. Next slide, please. Uh, so at this time, the administration's recommendation is to continue to collect the affordable housing sales tax revenues without allocation at this time and return to council once we have more refined cost estimates, more updated cost estimates for the TODOC project in uh, the first quarter of next year. As for timing and next steps, uh, if council were to agree with the administration's recommendation, we would of course continue to collect those revenues. We would get those updated cost estimates and return to council in the first quarter of next year to discuss use of funds and those options for allocating the funds. If council prefers the, uh, to discuss those alternatives now and consider allocating those revenues now, then uh, we would need to look to amending the proposed budget during the budget discussions that are occurring in the next few weeks. And next slide, thank you. So as I stated before, the administration's recommendation is to continue to hold on to those um, tax revenues without allocating them, continue to collect them, and return to council again in the winter um, or early part of next year. Any any questions? So Andrea, this is the mayor. I just want a clarification. You have uh, two things here. One is a recommendation to continue to collect. That is time sensitive. And you have a second question, which you want to get some direction, and that is whether or not uh, the council wants to uh, wait for additional information to the allocation 
or make an allocation, in which case they could do that during budget. So uh, we'll take questions and then uh, maybe we break it out into to those two subjects because I'm not sure the continuation of collection may have as many questions as the allocation. So we'll sort of structure our conversation that way. And we're going to start with Council Member Walsh. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is Council Member Walsh. So, Andrea, first of all, thank you for the presentation and um, pulling this information together. Um, I know we talked earlier today, but I want to just bring it to light. Um, in trying to evaluate the, the use of these uh, affordable housing revenues and how we might allocate those, one of the options presented is potentially ARCH funding. Uh, Regional Coalition for Housing. And so I was wondering if you could talk through the different ways that we fund ARCH and the difference between the administrative funding and the housing trust fund and what the city's planned approach is for that housing trust fund um, for this upcoming year so that we have a better understanding of what, what our planned um, funding level is and what our different options are in that realm. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Walsh. Again, this is Andrea Snyder. Um, the, uh, the city funds ARCH in two ways. And so uh, there was some information in your packet this evening on the consent calendar um, about how we fund ARCH. The first way uh, that you approved over consent today is the administrative fee. And so that covers some of the the overhead costs of ARCH and providing affordable housing and the programs that they provide. Um, that is, uh, that's the, what you approved this evening would be part of the uh, 2022 budget. There's also the housing trust fund, which really goes towards uh, helping fund the construction of affordable housing. And typically ARCH uh, at this time of year would ask us for a contribution and would, would name that contribution for us to consider in this budget process. They uh, have not done so yet uh, because they are looking at changing their formula for uh, how they spread out the costs of providing housing across the other member cities. And they haven't come to an agreement on that formula yet. And so they are going to be um, accepting project, app project applications for that funding this fall the board will be taking a look at that and then come back to the cities uh, again, Q1 of 2022 for their housing trust fund contribution requests and to, um, to finalize that new formula that they're trying to change. So all of that is still in the works regarding the housing trust fund. Um, we could use 1406 or 1590 funds uh, to contribute to the housing trust fund, certainly. Does that answer your full question, Councilmember Walsh? Um, one more thing that I think we talked about earlier was there um, is an amount in the 2022 budget where we've already anticipated an amount and that I believe is planned to come from the general fund. At this time, the budget, the proposed budget is not proposing it's um, coming out of these housing funds, is that correct? That is correct. So um, what we have done in the proposed budget for 2022 is uh, kept it basically the same as the city has done in the past. And so in the adopted budget for 2021, we uh, council approved $175,000 that would go towards the housing trust fund contribution uh, from the general fund. And so we've kept that $175,000 $75,000 as a placeholder until we have more information from ARCH. And then we would return to council and have another conversation about, you know, is the $175,000 placeholder, is that the correct amount? Um, is ARCH asking uh, for more or less? And to have a conversation with council about that once we hear more from ARCH. Thank you. Andrew, Walsh. That. Great. You got your answers. Let's go to council member D. Michelle. Uh, thank you. Um, so looking at the packet tonight and looking at the arch work plan that they uh, sent to us, there was um, there was at least in the work plan, 
there's an item in there where they are going to help us with our TODOC project. And um, so beyond that, I mean, already we are getting some service back for the funds that we contribute. Uh, but beyond that, has Arch made any commitment to the TOD uh, OC project um, when, it get, when we get to the construction phase of that? Thank you. Uh, yes, instead of just nodding, I, I will verbalize my answer and say, yes, they have committed uh, some of the funds uh, that they have for construction of projects as part of the financing for the TODOC project. Councilmember DeMichelle, that answers your question. Great, we'll go to Deputy Council President Ray. Thank you, Mayor Polly. This is Chris Ray. This may be a really silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Can we give, if we give Arch more money than they asked for, is that create a problem for them? Or um, can they, um, I'll just leave it right there. <laughs> I uh, Thank you. G great question. Uh, I, and I apologize if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Um, yes, uh, they, other cities have chosen to contribute uh, to ARCH that's beyond what they've requested. I'm not sure if it's just me, but is Andrea frozen? Yeah, she's frozen. And and okay. it was right at, the, right at the good part too. Well, maybe with her camera off, we'll be able to get her back here. Andrea, are you able to talk to us even if we can't see you? So can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great, so sorry about that. Um, yes, so uh, ARCH, other cities have chosen to provide additional funding to ARCH. Um, and uh, and so that's something that Issaquah can always choose. Uh, the board helps decide what a, a formula, they call it parity, to, to, um, to determine what's kind of an equitable thing to charge across the member cities, but member cities can always opt to provide more in funding. I think, you know, if that were the case, um, whether it comes to, whether Issaquah, if you want to consider providing more funding than what they've requested, does that go towards the construction of affordable housing? Does that go towards kind of the management of the program side of affordable housing? Those would be things that uh, we'd need to discuss in the future if you wanted to go that route. Great, thanks. Um, just kind of a follow on question to that. Um, what are there any restrictions on either 1406 or 1590 on on using the funds for construction versus operating cost or uh, can we split them across the two kind of cost, cost categories uh, both are both 1406 and 1590 can be used towards the construction acquisition and maintenance of affordable housing. Uh, there are slight differences though in other areas in what they can fund. For example, 1406 can go towards tenant rental assistance, um, whereas 1590 can go towards mental and behavioral health services. And that's one of the reasons why council had decided when uh, council adopted 1590 was uh, to consider using a portion of those funds to help pay for the Opportunity Center, which will have uh, behavioral and mental health services. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions and the motion does have uh, two pieces to it. So I just gonna check in with the city clerk before the council um, provide comment or deliberates it, should we have somebody make a motion? That would be ideal. Great, Deputy Council President Ray. Um, I'd like to make a motion. I'm actually going to take these as, uh, I'm going to take them as parts. So I move to direct the administration to continue to collect the affordable housing sales tax revenue. And do I see a second? I'm looking in the chat. Councilmember Walsh. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and second. Deputy Council President Ray, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah, th thank you. I, I 
I think there is a lot that we can do with the sales tax revenue, given the flexibility in 1406 and 1590. And the reason I separated these into two discrete buckets is I like the idea of the city having um, some control right now over um, the collection and directing of the revenues for affordable housing. And um, so I would like to continue with this revenue collection part of it for sure. Thank you. I'd give the second council member Walsh an opportunity to comment. Oh, did I get that wrong? Oh, I see council member Michelle also seconded it. So I'll go to her next, but council member Walsh comment. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I think it would behoove the city to continue to collect the affordable housing sales tax revenues. We have some specific projects, whether that's ARCH or uh, TODOC or other affordable housing um, opportunities within the city that um, I think could be useful for that funds. That being said, I think myself and others in the city have certainly said, Hey, we're willing to talk to King County and um, consider this revenue source in the future. Um, but until we can enable that conversation and understand um, how that might be used and how uh, our particular projects are affected, um, I think it behooves us to continue to collect the affordable housing sales tax revenues. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Walsh. Councilmember D. Michelle, did you want to comment? Um, I, I think council members Ray and Walsh said it very well, and I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you very much. Is there a council president Hunt comment? Thank you. This is council president Hunt. Um, I have a different take on this. I appreciate that they're separated out. Um, so on the collections, the continuing to collect the affordable, um, Housing sales tax. There are two. One is SDH 1406, which is the pass through state tax, and that one I think we should continue to collect. However, I um, do have concerns about HB 1590, the King County, um, the King County tax, um, also a sales tax. And my concern about this one is really that I think King County is in a better position to leverage this kind of funding. When we initially talked about this, um, some cities decided to go ahead and uh, take the tax and use that for um, local projects or to have more ability to decide what happens. And some cities decided to um, to not do that, in which case King County began collecting the tax. And since then, they've begun a regional effort against for, um, to support individuals experiencing homelessness. And I think they're in a better position to act on the scale, which is a regional scale for the problem. So um, I, I think homelessness is a regional issue. They are positioned to address it in a regional way and they've begun that work with the tax that they've been collecting um, since some of the cities did not go ahead and um, implement their own tax. I also uh, revisited the conversation we had last time and um, uh, which was around a year ago now, October of 2020. And at that point, um, the King County Council Member Balducci wrote an email to us and was very supportive of the TOD. And I think recognized that like us, she, they would need to have a vote to actually formalize that. But I don't expect that we're going to have more confirmation than a very, very supportive email that we did receive as well as um, as well as uh, an earmarked amount of money that they've put aside as well for this project. So I think that um, I think we have as much confirmation on this from the county as they're actually able to give. Um, and so from my perspective, I, I don't think we should continue collecting this and I think we should be um, in a part of a regional solution. Uh, and then lastly, I think if the TOD succeeds, you know, we'll be getting state, um, we're getting state grants already. We're having ARCH help us. So it's a regional effort as well. And I think being a regional, submit, or um, being a part of the regional solution is really the way to go. So I won't be supporting this because I don't think we should continue to collect and not allocate 1590. Thank you, Council President Hunt. Council Member Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
Uh, I will be supporting this this evening, and I think um, I appreciated Councilmember Balducci's comments a year ago, but I, I think the intervening year has told us why it's a good idea for us to keep this money close at hand right now, because we basically said, uh, you know, we'd be happy to put this money into King County if we can get some sort of memorandum of understanding from the county, and the county hasn't had the time to do that because they've been really busy trying to do the pieces that they're trying to do, right, which is buying properties and, and converting properties, and we are the tiniest little fish at the east end of the county compared to all the other work that they're doing, so I think that that just reinforces the wisdom of the decision a year ago to keep this money close at hand for right now. Uh, and have it available for the things that are important to us. While we did commit to a regional, you know, regional partnership, we just said that this project, we feel, you know, we, we feel that we have opportunities um, that uh, are in line with uh, affordable uh, housing efforts in the county. And so we're gonna, we're gonna resolve some of those before we put money back in. And I just, I feel this last year has shown the wisdom of making that decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Martz. And I'm going to check in with Councilmember Hall or Goodman. We have a request for second round of comments, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to comment first if either of you would like to. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, sure, this is Councilmember Hall. Just to say um, that I think Councilmember Martz reached into my brain and pulled out the exact words that I want to say. So, ditto for that. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman, before I move to a second round. Um, Councilmember Goodman here. No, I don't think I have any comments right now. I feel the, I feel the same way I did a year ago. I don't like the strategy. I don't like the way it happened. And um, my only heartburn is that we've got these two tied together. So. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Councilmember De Michelle. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a slightly different take on this. Um, I, I support what the county is doing and the strategy that they're using in buying up hotels and motels and turning those into uh, residential, you know, uh, accommodations for people who are experiencing homelessness. And at the same time, uh, I want to hold on to the money locally. Um, I don't know that there would be a place in Issaquah where the county's strategy will actually be applicable. And um, my knowledge of uh, people who are in homelessness is that it's very, very difficult for them to leave their local community, their local network, um, the, um, the things that they are used to, and to move somewhere else. And so if we go with the county's strategy, we're saying basically that anyone from Issaquah who's experiencing homelessness, uh, who would be a part of that program is going to have to move. Um, I would much rather see our dollars go to permanent um, affordable housing and the behavioral health services that would go along with that project. And so I think the county's doing a great thing. I support it completely, but for the people of Issaquah, I wanna hold on to that money and spend it here locally so that our people experiencing homelessness can possibly have better services right here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember D. Michelle. I am not seeing, and I will give it a few more seconds, anybody else with follow up comments, which means I will reread the motion and call for the vote. Uh, it was moved and seconded to direct the administration to continue to collect the affordable housing sales tax revenues. Uh, City Clerk, do you want to do the roll call vote? Yes, yeah, starting with Councilmember D. Michelle. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Nay. Councilmember Hall. Aye. Council President Hunt. Nay. Councilmember Mart. Aye. Deputy Council President Ray. Aye. Councilmember Walsh. Aye. That's five ayes, two noes. Thank you. That passes five to two. And now I'm looking to see if I could get somebody to make a motion for the second part. Deputy Council President Ray. 
Um, I move to direct the administration to not allocate the affordable housing uh, sales tax revenue at this time and to return to the city council once cost estimates for the TOD Opportunity Center project have been updated. Thank you. Council Member DeMichelle. Second. It's been moved and seconded, and I'll go to the motion maker first, Deputy Council President Ray. Um, thank you, Mayor Polly. Chris Ray, this one to me was really in alignment with the spirit of when we um, adopted this sales tax and we're working saying we want to do it. We wanted to get the Opportunity Center and the TOD built and we wanted to um, support that. Um, if uh, negotiations with King County can continue and, and uh, bear fruit, then, then that's great. That was always our intent. But I think this way we have a little more control over it and we're in better position to fund this um, important um, development in the in the community. Thank you, uh, Council Member D. Michelle. So we're now in uh, September, and if um, the projections are correct, we will get cost updates at the very very latest by March of 2022. So that means we have to be patient again at the out at the out <laughs> outside uh, six months, maybe less, hopefully four months. Um, and I think we can wait that long. We've been waiting for this uh, project for a number of years. I wanna see it through to the end and uh, I am willing to wait to get those uh, projected cost uh, estimates. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Walsh. Thank you. This is Council Member Walsh. Um, I'm trying to understand how, uh, how to approach this. Um, my perspective is that general fund money and so looking at it like the affordable housing uh, revenues, that has a limited scope of what it can be used on, whereas general fund money can 